This program is brought to you by Emory University. I have a special fondness for high school baseball fields. It's true that these simple ball fields lack the storied verdure of iconic ballparks. There's no sudden splash of sunlight and greenness that takes you by surprise as you pass through the dark inner corridors of an urban stadium to enter the seating area. To come upon all that light and color takes hold of you like an epiphany. In contrast, high school fields are usually open to their immediate surroundings. Children and adults enter them freely on weekends and evenings. In the off season, they're empty, weed grown and wind blown. They seem built to some forgotten purpose. The baseball field at Shambly High School in Atlanta, Georgia, where my son played baseball for five years, had a wearied multi-purpose character. It reminded me of a middle school history teacher who was also the assistant women's soccer coach. The football team scheduled its fall and summer practices on the outfield grass and an assortment of weighted sleds, tires, and tackling dummies were stored outside the equipment shed behind first base. Plastic mouth guards and broken chin straps littered the playing field and the foul territory beside the bullpens. But early in February, on the first days of spring tryouts, it still seemed like a little piece of heaven. The dimensions of the infield in baseball are specified in the rule book. 90 feet between bases, 60 feet 6 inches from the back of home plate to the front of the pitcher's rubber, measured on a line extending from home to second base. But the configuration of the rest is left to whim or more often to physical constraints. The ball field at Shambly had an extremely short right field owing to the existence of a steep hill immediately behind it. It was only 250 feet down the line with a 12-foot high chain mesh fence covering the rightmost 30 feet in a futile gesture to keep left-handed hitters honest. From there, the fence dived sharply back until it terminated 450 feet away from home plate in a towering brick wall that formed the southwest side of the school gymnasium. Sometimes a home run was hit to straightaway center, but the batters always had to run at top speed to circle the bases because the ball never made it onto the roof to escape the field of play. At Shambly, games took place just over a hundred yards from a major suburban thoroughfare, Shambly Dunwoody Road, and so the sounds of moving traffic became part of the background noise of the game. At other, more isolated baseball fields, you see only the grass, the dirt, the uniformed players, and you hear only the chatter of voices from the dugouts or the smack of a ball against leather and wood. The only right field shorter than Shambly's where serious baseball was played was the old Congress Street grounds, Chicago's first West Side Park, where the distance from home plate to the fences down the foul lines were as short as 216 feet. For comparison, the outfield fences in Little League World Series play at Williamsport are set at 225 feet. It was at the Congress Street grounds that the Major League home run record of 27 was set in 1884 by one Edward Nagel Williamson, who played for the Chicago Colts. Williamson's record stood for 35 years until it was broken finally by, who else? Babe Ruth. Depending on the place from where I watched the game, whether directly behind the catcher or off to the first base side, I could almost swear that this was an early summer afternoon in a ball field near Allentown, Pennsylvania where I grew up, and that if I so wished, what lay on the other side of the fence was not a memory, but the real landscape as well. For some reason, perhaps a shadow of memory of oak and maple trees in full leaf against a setting sun, the sight of the trees beyond the fence lifted me back to rural Pennsylvania and to a town called Hockendaqua, a town that no longer exists, swallowed up first by post-World War II suburban growth, and next by a desire on the part of the inhabitants to expunge from their identity all traces of ethnicity. Now they call it Whitehall. The Shambly fence was a source of controversy for one other reason. It was usually in a state of disrepair. The wire mesh stretched and strung by countless weekend trespassers who clambered back and forth over it to gain access to the field for their games of soccer or touch football. Balls often became trapped accidentally under the fence where it was pulled away from the ground. And now and then a crafty outfielder if he saw that the umpires had their eyes on the runner and not on the ball, would kick a deep line drive underneath the fence. Knowing the rules of the field would hold the batter to a double and prevent the run from scoring from first base on the play. 
That kind of deception actually was part of baseball in the early days of the 20th century. Outfielders often pretended they had caught fairly balls that they had actually trapped, and runners rounding second or third regularly cut their turns short of the bag if they knew the umpire was watching the ball. It wasn't until 1911 that baseball's rule book called for a second umpire to help spot any shenanigans on the part of the runners, and the four-man umpiring crew, now standard for all but playoff game baseball, didn't become mandatory until 1953. This reminds me that baseball as it was played at Shambly High School was like a return to the game of more than half a century ago. Fewer umpires, no lights, and so almost all games were played after school in the late afternoon. The DeKalb County Athletic Association was fiercely democratic and they refused to spend money on sports facilities for one school unless they had enough to spend the same amount for the same purpose on all. Their intentions were honorable but the result was in fact less democratic, not more. Only a handful of schools in wealthy districts where the parents of ball players themselves paid the bill had lights on their baseball field. Playing games in the daylight could be a problem early in the season, especially during March when daylight savings time had not yet begun. And those first six or eight games were always played under threat of suspension because of darkness. The games at ball fields like these brought back the golden era of baseball in one other way too. There was always the risk of flying glass. For the fan who goes to baseball games in search of nostalgia, taking in a home game at a high school field works in much the same way as Proust's tea-soaked Madeline. You remember, uh, if you've read uh, uh, Proust's uh, novel, Remembrance of Things Past, uh, he uh, tries to write about his childhood but can't remember it. And so one day, quite accidentally, he happens to dip a cookie, a Madeline, uh, in a cup of tea. And it's that taste that suddenly opens the gates of his memory and he remembers it all. Shambly was situated directly behind the school building, uh, shoehorned into the wedge of space between two narrow residential streets that converged about 30 feet behind home plate. Cars and homes were in constant peril from foul balls or home runs. When the wind blows out toward left center at Wrigley Field in Chicago, home runs still occasionally shatter nearby apartment windows. And at Old Scheib Park in North Philadelphia, the sounds of balls striking roofs and windows were part of a summer afternoon in the 1920s. It was exactly the same way in the first decade of the 21st century at Shambly. Foul balls easily cleared the low, slanting screen immediately behind home plate and bounced off the walls or in the driveways of houses. Balls slicing off the bats of left-handed hitters routinely dinged the bodywork of cars parked by the low fence along the third base line. Those cars parked behind the batting cages by left field sometimes had their windshields shattered by home runs or by balls that magically ex exited the batting cage screens, like quantum particles tunneling into an alternate universe. All that seemed part of the game. Every foul ball came with a story. This one dented a door panel, that one took out a sunroof. The risk of property damage seemed to lend to games a surplus frisson, an excitement. Doug Horn, the father of the shortstop, even parked his expensive Corvette de deliberately in the line of fire for thrills and for luck. There's a world of difference between watching a game from the bleachers and observing it through television's falsifying eye. Fans who watched the game on television remained largely oblivious to its intricate choreography. Even a simple ground out to deep short with no one on base involves the coordinated movement of at least four players, not counting the runner. It's impossible for the TV camera to take in all of it. And to attempt to display the different actions on split screens obscures their harmony. On television, a grounder to short looks distinctly uneventful. And unless the shortstop needs to make an extraordinary effort to feel the ball hit deep in the hole or up the middle, the whole thing looks boring as well. But even setting aside the fact that for an infield to make what looks like a routine play on a ball slicing and bounding over the grass at 60 miles an hour, itself requires extraordinary timing, balance, and coordination, not to mention a degree of bravery, if not faith. Here is what is actually happening in the five seconds it takes from the time the ball leaves the pitcher's hand until it smacks the outstretched mitt of the first baseman. As the ball is struck and the batter starts to run toward first, the shortstop, already anticipating the likely trajectory of the ball, moves forward and angles to his right to cut it off. At the same time, the first baseman is sliding left and positioning his right foot 
assuming he's right-handed, on the infield side of the base to take the throw from short. Also simultaneously, the second baseman is moving to cover his base and prevent the runner from advancing in case any error is made somewhere on the play. Meanwhile, even as three of the four infielders are redeploying themselves, the catcher has flung off his mask and is sprinting, sprinting in full gear down the first base line to back up the long throw from short. Next to the pitcher, the shortstop typically has the strongest arm. Often it's a cannon. The catcher also intends to prevent the runner from taking second base on an overthrow. All this is as precisely choreographed as any dance sequence, and to the trained eye and appreciative eye, it is balletic. The sequence of events can be seen properly only by somebody who is present at the field of play. The TV camera just follows the ball. Routine grounder to short. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.